rubric 6.60? Yes, I have. Uh, and in preparing that witness statement, have you drawn either on your own information or on the information of others within the FSC? Yes, both. And is the information contained in that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. Uh, Commissioner, I tender the summons. Uh, exhibit 6.408, the summons to Ms Lone. And I tender Ms Lone's witness statement, which is dated uh, 30 August 2018, together with Exhibit SL1. The statement of Ms Lone of 30 August 18, together with its exhibits, becomes Exhibit 6.409. Yes, 409. Thank you, Mr Elliot. Yes, Ms Orr. Ms Lone, you've been the CEO of the Financial Services Council since December 2014. Yes. Uh, and is it fair to say that your background before that position uh, was in media and PR? Uh, partly, yes. Also, um, I spent 10 years in the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. So you uh, were the Director of Media and Public Affairs at Coca-Cola Amatil? Yes. Uh, and you had 25 years in the media industry? Correct. Um, so your background is not one of financial services? No, it is not. Now, the Financial Services Council has five different categories of members, including yes. full members. Correct. And the full members of the Financial Services Council are all organisations in the trustee company services, managed investment, superannuation, funds management, financial advice or life insurance industries. Uh, advice licensees rather than financial advisors. We don't represent individual financial advisors, no. Uh, but the full members come from those industries, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, now, of the different financial service industries represented by the Financial Services Council, uh, would you say that any one is more prominent than another? Um, what do you mean by prominent? Well, in the activities that you're responsible for, um, are the um, members who belong to the superannuation industry, uh, for example, more prominent than the members who belong to the financial advice or life insurance industries? Uh, we have m the majority of our members come from the, uh, the funds management area. Okay. Uh, now, could you explain to the Commission what the main purposes of the Financial Services Council are? Um, yes, we're a, a peak industry body representing those five uh, streams across financial services in Australia. Um, we uh, represent um, around 100 members, um, approximately 70 of which are what we call full members. And um, our job essentially is to advocate for, for policy, uh, develop policy, um, we also um, uh, develop standards for our members which um, uh, go to um, best practice and, uh, in, in the sector. Is it fair to say that one of the main activities of the Financial Services Council is to lobby the government in relation to laws that affect the financial services industry? Yes. Uh, to encourage the government to make those laws more favourable to the industry? I think, um, yes, we certainly represent our members. Um, my view is that, um, you know, at the back of, of that is good public policy as well. Mm -hmm. But you accept that your lobbying activity is engaged in to encourage the government to make laws that are more favourable to the industries that you represent? Um, we represent our members, yes. Do you accept my proposition, Ms Lone? More favourable, um, yes, in, in part. Mm -hmm. uh, only in part? Um, Yes, essentially, um, when we do um, um, advocacy activities, it's repre to represent our members and their, and their views. Yes, yes, with the objective of making, um, uh, of ensuring that the laws that the government makes are more favourable to your members. Y yes. Right. All right. Now, uh, one of your purposes is the promotion of best practice in the financial services industry by setting standards. Is yes. that right? And one of those standards is the Life Insurance Code of Practice? Yes. 
uh, and full members of the Financial Services Council are required to comply with the standards issued by the Financial Services Council. All the standards, yes. Yes, and that includes the life code. Only the life um, insurance members are required to uh, adhere to the life code. Now, the life code was developed in 2016. Yes. Uh, why did the FSC decide to develop the life code in 2016? Um, the life code was developed after quite a long um, uh, um, period. Um, it started. It all started with an ASIC report in 2014, just before I joined. Um, that ASIC review looked into practices in the life insurance sector, particularly around the advice, um, uh, life insurance advice, and um, came up with a number of fa uh, fi findings that were not favourable to the sector, um, certainly not favourable for consumer outcomes. Um, the FSC then decided to um, engage an independent um, uh, person, an independent expert, to do a full review of the life insurance industry. Um, we were joined in that with the uh, Association of Financial Advisers, the, the AFA, and we um, uh, engaged Mr John Trowbridge, a former uh, APRA member, um, and he took several months to come up with a, a very comprehensive um, I guess, view of life insurance and the um, reforms that came out of his review or the recommendations. Some of them were legislated um, and at least one of them was the um, recommendation to have uh, a code of practice for life insurers and that's what we took on board. So it was a recommendation in Mr Trowbridge's report yes. uh, that a life code be developed? Correct. Yes. Um, now why didn't the Financial Services Council develop a code of practice for the life insurance industry before that time? Um, I really don't know. Um, the, as I said, the code was one of Mr Trowbridge's recommendations. Mr Trowbridge's report came from the ASEC report, which identified um, quite a few issues to do with um, misaligned incentives for selling life insurance. Um, I, I, can't, I can't say why it wasn't done beforehand. You know that there had been a general insurance code of practice in place since the 1990s? Yes. Um, and why did the Financial Services Council need a review to tell it that it was desirable uh, to implement a code of practice for the life insurance industry? Well, um, I can't, I, I don't, I simply don't, don't know. know the answer to that, no. But that's, that's the procedure that happened. And should it have been developed earlier, in your view, Ms I Lone? I think that's for others to say, but... Um, well, you, know, you are the CEO yes, of the now. Financial yes. Services Council. Mm. In your view, should the life insurance industry have had a code of practice prior to 2016? Quite possibly, yes. Quite possibly? Yes. You don't think it would have been desirable for a code of practice to be in place for the life insurance industry much earlier than 2016? Yes. You think it would have been desirable? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, now, I want to come back to the life code um, and the insurance in superannuation code a little later, uh, but I want to ask you first about some of the topics that have been raised in the case studies that were examined by the Commission last week uh, and a bit earlier this week. Uh, the first of those topics is the direct sale of life insurance. Yes. Uh, now, last week the Commission heard evidence from representatives of two entities, Clearview and Freedom, about the sale of life insurance directly to consumers. Yes. Did you hear the evidence given in those case yes, studies? I did. Yes. Uh, are there any observations that you would like to make at the outset on either of those case studies? Uh, I thought the, the practices were like it, everybody uh, thought were, were very poor and uh, very disappointing. The practices were very poor and very disappointing. Yes. And the effect on the consumers was, was clearly um, highly detrimental and to be, to be absolutely regretted. Are you familiar with ASIC's report 587 on the sale of direct life insurance, which was released at the end of August? Yes, I am. 
Uh, and you know that in that report, ASIC looked at the practices of six life insurers and three distributors who sold life insurance directly to consumers. Yes. Um, and are you aware that for the purposes of report 587, ASIC reviewed hundreds of outbound sales calls conducted both before and after the life code came into effect? Yes, I do. Uh, and in ASIC's first review of calls, which related to calls made between 2010 and 2016, ASIC found that all of the firms included in the review engaged in pressure selling. Yes. And ASIC found that the sales calls featured inadequate explanations of future cost and product exclusions, promotional gifts, and tactics to reduce informed decision making. Yes. Uh, ASIC also undertook a second review of sales calls, which related to calls made in July and August this year, after the life code had come into force. Yes. Uh, and ASIC noted that for many firms, conduct had improved uh, and that was likely due in part to the code. Yes, I read that. But ASIC nonetheless observed pressure selling tactics used by firms in that period. Yes. And it observed firms providing inadequate explanations of exclusions for pre-existing medical conditions. Yes. Uh, and it observed that firms didn't consistently provide clear explanations of the likely future cost of a person's policy. Yes. Do you have any observations on those findings in your capacity of CEO, as CEO of the Financial Services Council, Ms Lone? Um, absolutely. That report is... Um, um, we're going over that with a very fine-tooth comb. Um, we're looking at all the recommendations made in that report. Um, we have uh, at, in train at the moment the next iteration of the life code and uh, we will be doing our utmost to include uh, the recommendations um, which will lead to hopefully uh, those practices not being, uh, not, being um, um, not, not happening again and, and certainly we, we are looking to put those, uh, some of those examples in, our, in the second um, iteration of our code. In addition to the review of sales calls, ASIC also considered data provided by the entities, the entities' products, their policies and their procedures and the sales culture of the entities. Did mm. you see that in the report? Yes. And after listening to the calls and considering all of that extra information that it had brought in, ASIC found that outbound sales are more commonly associated with poor sales conduct and increase the risk of poor consumer outcomes. Yes. Do you agree with that, Ms Lone? Yes. And ASIC also found that from 2012 to 2017, one in five of all policies taken out were cancelled in the cooling off period. Yes. And ASIC considered that that figure might indicate that consumers immediately realised they'd made a bad decision or had been pressured into buying a policy they didn't need. Yes. Uh, and ASIC found that a quarter of all policies that remained in force beyond the cooling off period lapsed within 12 months. Yes. And that almost half of all policies held beyond the cooling off period lapsed within three years. Yes. Do you have any observations about those findings? It's not a good outcome either for the firms or for the consumers. Well, what does it say about whether consumers were being sold products that they wanted and needed. It clearly says that um, those tactics were incorrect and that's certainly something that we're addressing in the second iteration of our code. The first iteration does um, go into um, uh, detail on direct sales but we have a lot more to say in the second iteration of the code. Are you aware that ASIC found that claim outcomes for direct life insurance were also poor relative to life insurance sold through other channels? Yes. Um, having read uh, the report on the direct sale of life insurance, Ms Lone, what is the Financial Services Council's position on whether the direct sale of life insurance should continue? Mm. Uh, look, I think our view is that, yes, it's a, a legitimate product when done correctly. Um, life insurance, I think, as others have observed, is um, often a grudge sale and um, people 
have to be encouraged to take out life insurance. Um, I think anything that helps people understand life insurance is a, is a reasonable product and it's sold directly to people, um, particularly um, online to consumers which, that may not sit down with, a, with an underwriter and go through that process. It, it can be beneficial, but clearly where there are pressure selling tactics involved um, and in, uh, inadequate cooling off periods, then it's not a good product. I think given um, some of the things that, are, that have been found and given the things that we've, we're now putting into our code, it, it still can be a reasonable and legitimate product. Does the Financial Services Council have a view on whether direct sales of life insurance should continue to be made via outbound telephone calls? Um, not as such. Um, we certainly have a view about uh, cold calling, um, which is um, unlawful, and we certainly have a view about pressure selling. Um, by outbound, you mean cold calling? I just mean by outbound sales calls. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I, I don't have a fully formed view about that at this stage. Does the Financial Services Council have a view about that in light of the ASIC report and in light of the evidence uh, given in the Royal Commission last week? Um, well, what I understand is that um, cold calling is, is, is unlawful, pressure selling is a very poor um, instrument um, and should not be allowed. Um, I think given the right um, boundaries and people have accepted um, conditions, then outbound calling um, may be legitimate. It may be legitimate. Yes, it may be, yes. Mm -hmm. But what, I'm sorry, I can't give you any more. Well, what that. needs to be done by the Financial Services Council to ensure that it's legitimate? Well, that's what we're addressing in our code. All right. Well, the Life Code contains provisions in relation to the sale and advertising of life insurance policies, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, and among other things, those provisions require the entities who are bound by the code to do or refrain from doing certain things when advertising life insurance policies. Do you yes, accept that's that? Correct. Yes. Uh, and to have clearly documented sales rules to prevent pressure selling. Yes. And to have a clearly documented framework in place to monitor compliance with sale, sales rules. Yes. Um, but those obligations only apply to life insurers who are bound by the code. Yes. They don't apply to entities like Freedom, which sell life insurance policies on behalf of life insurers. Not in the first edition of the code, but they will be, they will be in the second edition of the so code. So the next edition of the code will extend to distributors of life insurance. Correct. Now, are you aware that Mr Martin, the Chief Actuary and Risk Officer of Clearview, expressed the view that it was difficult to understand how direct life insurers could reconcile financial viability and legal compliance? Yes, I heard him say that, yes. Do you have any observations about that, Ms Lone? Um, I would certainly take his views into consideration. Um, Clearview are a member of ours and um, we would always listen to, to what our members say about their products and the way they're being sold, yes. And Mr Orton, the Chief Operating Officer of Freedom Insurance, said that it was possible to sell uh, direct life insurance in outbound sales in a way that was financially viable and legal compliant, but this it would involve changes to the model. Do you recall that evidence? Um, yes, now that you've reminded me, yes. Now, despite industry participants holding those views, the FSC doesn't support restricting the outbound sale of direct life insurance by telephone. Um, I, I'd like to just um, reflect on that. Um, we will certainly take all of the um, evidence that's come before this Royal Commission and what our members um, tell us about those particular products into consideration. I'm sorry, I don't have a, um, I don't, I can't, give you any further um, information on outbound calls. I want to move to asking you about the handling of insurance claims, Ms Lone. Uh, both the ComInsure and the TAL case studies, the
that we examined last week raised issues on that topic. Did you hear the evidence in those case studies? Yes, I did. And now, in relation to the TAL case study, Ms Van Eden, TAL's Head of Claims, accepted that the way in which TAL dealt with one of the three claims that her evidence covered um, was not efficient, honest or fair. Do you recall that evidence? Yes. Um, but life insurers are not currently subject to an obligation to do all things necessary to ensure that they handle insurance claims efficiently, honestly or fairly, are they? You mean by law? Yes. Uh, that are, they're subject to the, the utmost, um, the, the law that prescribes um, doing the utmost duty, yes. Are you referring to the provision in the Insurance Contracts Act which requires insurers to so. act towards insured people with the utmost good faith? Yes, I believe so. But they are not subject to any legal obligation to do all things necessary to ensure that they handle insurance claims efficiently, honestly and fairly, are they? Uh, no, they, they're subject to a carve-out. Under that, I think That's it's the ASIC right. Act. That's yes. right. Well, yes. Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act doesn't extend to the handling of insurance claims because claims handling is excluded from the definition of a That's financial correct. service. That's correct, yes. Um, now, in your statement, you refer to the Financial Service Council's views on that carve out. Yes. Uh, and you say that the FSC does not support the removal of the exception mm -hmm. or otherwise support the extension of ASIC's powers in relation to the handling and settlement of insurance claims. Yes. Why not, Ms Lone? My understanding of the carve-out as it is, uh, as it stands, is that often um, claims, hand, uh, claims operators, assessors, um, have to give some advice to people who call um, about their claims. And if they straight into an area that could be perceived as personal advice, then they, they would, me, would not be able to give that advice. It could be that they're um, reminding people that you can't claim twice on an income protection policy, for example. Um, and I think the idea is that they, did, they shouldn't be um, in the same category as a financial advisor, and I think that's the reason for the carve-out. Um, I think the reason that we're saying that this should stay is that um, in our code, um, and certainly in the second iteration of the code, we have a lot of provisions on um, how to behave, um, very quite granular prescriptions on commitments from claims assessors and claims handlers. Um, we would like to see if that code is producing those better outcomes. Um, the code is quite new. Um, also, APRA is doing um, quite a large data collection project on claims handling, and I think that comes out next year. And I think that would be useful again for informing our view. Um, it's not necessarily set in stone, but at this point, I think we're saying um, clearly claims handling needs to improve. Um, what's the best way to do it is turning claims handlers into financial advisors, that, that may not be the best way. Um, financial advisors are subject to um, a new regime for a great deal of um, training, university degrees, professional bodies, etc. Um, so I think at the moment we're saying, let's try and get the behaviours, let's try and get um, uh, um, all sorts of things fixed, let's see if the code can do that and have a look at what the APRA data tells us about claims handling. But in the meantime, consumers need to wait and potentially suffer detriment while you're assessing how this is working. No, well, the, the code is in force. And, but, um, but my point is about a statutory obligation to act in this yes, way. Yes, I know. Yes, I, I know the point you're making. Yes. And the Financial Services Council's position is that the statutory position should remain unchanged. As Claims handling should continue uh, to not be subject to an obligation to act efficiently, honestly and fairly? Yes, at this point, yes. Uh, does the FSC consider that life insurers should be subject to a statutory obligation to ensure that their representatives are adequately trained and are competent to handle insurance claims? Sorry, could you repeat that? 
does the FSC consider that life insurers should be subject to a statutory obligation to ensure that their representatives are adequately trained and competent to handle insurance claims? You understand that this is a statutory obligation that applies in respect of the provision of other financial products? Yes, I think you're asking me the same thing um, um, about claims handlers. No, I, I'm, I'm asking you. I'm ask, well, I'm asking you about um, the, the consequences of the carve out at the moment mm. are numerous because it takes the provision of um, uh, it takes claims handling outside of a regime that imposes multiple obligations. Do yes. you understand that? Yes, I do. And yes. one of those obligations is the obligation to ensure that your representatives are adequately trained and are competent to provide a particular service. And what I'm asking you is whether there is any reason why it should not be the case that there's a statutory obligation um, to ensure that representatives of life insurers are adequately trained and competent to handle insurance claims. Well, I think what, what we would say is that we um, absolutely agree that insurers and claims handlers should be adequately trained um, and competent, absolutely. So do you oppose the imposition of a statutory obligation to that effect? Yes, we, we maintain the carve-out for, for claims assessors well, at this point. Why, though? Uh, let's leave the carve-out to one side. If a statutory obligation could be imposed on life insurers, let's not worry too much about the fact that this situation arises because of a carve-out from the definition of financial services. Leaving that to one side, is there any reason why there should not be a freestanding statutory obligation on life insurers to ensure that their representatives are adequately trained and competent to handle insurance claims? Um, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure of, 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 of what you're asking me. Um, what we say about claims assessors is that we are giving a, a great deal more granularity around um, commitments to um, service training, etc. In in the code, um, we would like to see the code play out. We would like to see to see if that's working, um, as it has is starting to work in in some areas. Um, and I think we would like to see how APRA comes to its um, uh, conclusions about claims handling in its research document. Does the FSC consider that life insurers should not be required to report significant breaches of these sorts of obligations to ASIC? I, I, the claims handling to ASIC? These sorts of obligations that I've mm. been putting to you, is it your position um, that there should be no obligation on life insurers to report <coughs> breaches of those sorts of obligations to ASIC? The obligations around um, complaints around The claims. obligations that you resist, Ms Lone? Yes, the ones about claims, yes. Yes. Yes, it's still our, that's still our position. Um, the FSC doesn't consider it problematic that ASIC doesn't have the power to enforce breaches of any obligation to act efficiently, honestly and fairly in relation to claims handling? I can only repeat, I um, we are still, um, we, we would like to see the code work. Um, I think if claims assessors became uh, financial advisors, it would mean a great deal more um, I suppose, training to put them in a different category, um, they would then be subject to um, FACIA and perhaps all the, all the obligations that financial advisors are subject to. It may be using a term, um, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. We, well, we're, are we're you trying... worried about obligations like the best interest duty? No, not at all. No, we, 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 were, we are trying to get um, as good a result as we possibly can with the code, and if that doesn't deliver results, then clearly we will we'll, we will uh, consider.
Uh, the tail case study that we examined last week also raised issues in relation to the scope and operation of section 29 of the Insurance Contracts Act. Are you familiar with that provision, Ms Lone? Uh, could you remind me, please? Uh, well, section 29 provides that an insurer may, in some circumstances, avoid a contract if an insured has not complied with their duty of disclosure or has made a misrepresentation to the insurer. Are you familiar with that? Broadly. I can have it brought up on the screen if it assists you. Um, no, I, I understand that you have to disclose any pre-existing conditions, yes. Uh, and do you understand that an insurer can avoid a contract if an insured has not complied with the duty of disclosure or has made a misrepresentation? I, I understand that broadly, yes. Okay. Uh, now, did you hear the evidence given in the Tail case study? Yes. And in short compass, Ms Van Eden uh, gave evidence about TAL's general processes and its processes in relation to three particular policyholders uh, in connection with Section 29 of the Insurance Contracts Act. Yes. And in two of those uh, cases, TAL relied upon Section 29 to avoid a contract of insurance on the basis of a non-disclosure or misrepresentation of a health issue yes. which was unconnected to the condition in respect of which the claim was made. I do remember that, yes. yes. Now, one of those cases just predated the amendments to the scope of Section 29 that were made in 2013 and the other post-dated those amendments. Are you familiar with those amendments, Ms Lone? No, I'm not. Uh, the amending act introduced a number of significant amendments, including to the scope and operation of section 29.3. Now, if I can explain that to you, um, before the amendments, section 29.3 provided that if the insurer would not have been prepared to enter into a contract of life insurance with the insured on any terms, if the duty of disclosure had been complied with or the misrepresentation had not been made, then an insurer could avoid the contract within three years after the contract was entered into. Do you understand that? Yes. And since the amendments, the section has provided that an insurer may avoid a contract within three years if an insured's failure was not fraudulent or their misrepresentation was not made fraudulently. Yes. Uh, now, the effect of the amendment is that if an, the insurer would not have entered into a contract of insurance on the same terms, yes. had it known of the relevant facts, the insurer can now avoid the contract of insurance. Yes. Now, um, the amendment expanded the circumstances in which an insurer could rely on section 29.3 because it's now easier to show that a contract of insurance would not have been entered into on the same terms rather than showing that a contract of insurance wouldn't have been entered into on any terms. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we know from an exhibit to your statement that the FSC played a leading role in consultations with Treasury, both sides of Parliament and consumer representatives to advocate for the passage of that amending act. Are you aware of that, Ms Lone? Not to the detail, no, I'm sorry. Uh, well, we see that from um, Exhibit 10 to your statement, which is a document entitled FY13, the year in review. Have you read that document that you are next to your statement, Ms yes, Lone? Yes, I have. Um, that is FSC 0006 0001 1001. If we turn to 1006, we see under the heading Insurance Contracts Act, partway down the page, the passage that I've just read to you. Do you see that? Yes, I do. So the FSC supported the changes to section 29.3. Yes. Why? Um, I think, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, you I'm not. You don't know? Well, I, I, I certainly have people on my, that work for me who do this um, day in, day out, who can, um, inform me of the detail of this. 
Um, well, I, I want to ask you, but you may not be able to answer, uh, Ms Lone, whether you think that Section 29.3 now strikes the right balance between the interest of the insurer and the interest of the insured person. I think what we've said here is that the amendments contained in the bill include measures to improve efficiency and certainty for insurers and to achieve that appropriate balance, so yes, I would agree with that. That's so That's based on said. that sentence, uh, you answer yes. my question that you do think that section 29.3 now strikes the right balance between the interests of insurers and insured people? Um, look, I'm sorry, I don't have the up-to-date detail on when we said that and what we, what we think now. And I, you don't have a current position on that yourself? Uh, not myself, no. I don't know the detail of that, but I, I can certainly provide that detail to you. Okay. Uh, you've exhibited to your statement a document that you've referred to as a list of the key items which are being considered by the FSC as part of the second iteration of the Life Code. Do you recall yes. that? Yes, I do. Uh, can we go to that document, which is Exhibit 24, FSC 0006 0001 0302? And we see a number of items are listed under the heading agreed scope. So these are matters that are agreed that will be included in the next iteration of the life code. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, and under that heading at item seven, we see for general consent at claim, requests to be targeted to the cause of the claim, i.e. no fishing. Yes, I see that. Do you understand what that refers to, Ms No, I Lund? don't. I'm sorry. You I don't know what that refers no, to? No, I don't. This was put together by um, a member of my staff who is, his entire job is to deal with the code. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have that, but we could certainly get you that detail. But Ms Lone, you are the CEO of yes. the Financial Services Council, which is responsible for the development of the code, and you've been yes. put forward by the Financial Services Co Council to give evidence on these topics. We actually... Um, Mr. Barr. We did put forward two, two witnesses, Commissioner. The uh, uh, Mr. Kidson, who, who is responsible for the code, and, and Ms. Lone. Um, and that, as I understand it, that was not considered desirable. And we were asked to identify one person to give evidence on all topics. Well, we asked whether the CEO was capable of handling all of the items in the rubric that was sent to the Financial Services Council. And as a result of that question, we were provided with a statement covering yes. all of those matters by That's you right. and annexing this document to your statement. Yes. But are you unable to explain this document that you've annexed to your statement? I'm unable to, to explain the detail of number seven, um, and I apologise for that. Um, as, as I said, I'm, I'm the CEO. I have a lot of people on my staff and I have one particular expert whose day-to-day -day job it is to put together the code. Um, that's what he works on every day. Um, I've been uh, trying to spend um, every minute with him to understand the detail of his work and I'm sorry that I have uh, neglected uh, and not understood this particular detail but we can certainly get you that information. Well, I, I want to put to you, but I expect you'll be unable to answer, that this item has been included in recognition of the fact that provisions like Section 29 can result in substantial unfairness unless some restrictions are imposed on its operation. I, I, I couldn't answer, give you the detail of that, I'm sorry. All right. Now, another broader issue arising from the Tail case study related to the scope and ongoing applicability of the duty of disclosure. Are you aware of that? Could you remind me of that particular case? I did watch the, it. The Tail case study. Do you recall that yes. uh, one of the topics that was the subject of evidence was the duty of disclosure by an insured person? Yes. Are you aware of the insured's duty of disclosure contained in section 21 of the Insurance Contracts Act? I'm aware broadly that um, you need to disclose um, any pre-existing condition, yes. 
that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. Well, section 21 requires an insured person to disclose to the insurer a number of matters before the contract of insurance is entered into, including every matter that is known to the insured that the insured knows to be a matter relevant to the decision of the insurer whether to accept the risk. Yes. Uh, now, are you familiar with the provisions of the Insurance Contracts Act relating to misrepresentations by an insured person? Broadly, not in detail. Are you aware that since 2013, the UK has taken quite a different approach to non-disclosure and misrepresentations? No, I'm not aware of that. Well, in 2012, the UK Parliament passed legislation which substantially amended consumers' duty of disclosure in consumer insurance contracts. Are you aware of that? No, I'm not. Um, uh, the UK Parliament replaced the pre-existing duty of disclosure or representations, uh, uh, duty not to make represent misrepresentations, with a duty to take reasonable care not to make a misrepresentation to the insurer. Do you understand that? I, I just want to put that proposition to you, that the UK um, replaced um, provisions such as those we have with a duty to take reasonable care not to make a misrepresentation to the insurer. Yes, I think I, think I understand. Do you understand that? Um, does the FSC have any views on whether it would be desirable to introduce a similar change to the duty of disclosure in Australia? I don't have a view on that, no, I'm sorry. And you're unaware of whether the FSC I'm unaware, has a view on that? But I could certainly find out from Mr Kerwin. Now, I, I want to ask you some questions about life insurance and mental health. Yes. Uh, the Tal case study also raised questions about the way in which life insurers handle claims for mental health issues yes. and the way in which some life insurers interpret particular circumstances as indicating a pre-existing mental health condition. Yes. Um, does the Life Code currently address issues associated with mental health in life insurance claims? Not this particular code, not the first one, no. Um, now, uh, the FSC has been doing work in connection with mental health issues and life insurance for some years, is yes. that right? Yes. And extensive consultation had taken place prior to the introduction of the first version of the code? Uh, I think the first version of the code was done without a lot of um, uh, extensive consultation with the life, uh, uh, the mental health community. Um, I think our view at the time was that we wanted to get the code out quite quickly um, and more complex um, areas um, would, be, uh, would be attended to in the second version of the code. And that's certainly been the case. We've had um, a great deal of um, engagement with the mental health um, stakeholder community um, in the time, uh, certainly the last couple of years. and. Um, we do have a great deal more uh, granularity around uh, mental health in the next version of the code. Well, we see from the document on the screen that one of the things that's going to happen, uh, according to this document, with the next iteration of the code, is examples of good mental health questions in underwriting. Do you see that as item yes, four? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. Uh, now... If we turn to the uh, second page of this document, perhaps if we could bring the second and the third pages onto the screen together, we see, and I'm sorry, before we leave that page, you'll need to see the heading that applies to these two pages. If we could just go back to the first page, we've got two categories of items in this document. Yes. Agreed scope, which is 1 to 17. Yes. And still for consideration, which is Correct. what follows. Yes. Now, if we can go back to the second and third page, we see that one of the things that's still for consideration is item 14, which is that insurers are to ensure that applications for insurance that reveal a mental health condition or symptoms of a mental health condition are not automatically declined. Yes. That is still for consideration. 
I'm not sure where we're up to there. Um, I know this document was, was written some time ago. Um, some of the still for consideration may have shifted into the are being done uh, bucket. Um, again, this is... Um, you, you're unable to say, Ms Lane? Are you able to say whether any of the aspects of paragraph 14, which relates to the treatment of mental health in connection with life insurance claims, are matters that the FSC has now decided should be dealt with in the new iteration of the code? I believe that's correct, yes. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand that answer. I'm, I'm asking you whether any of those matters have been decided to be now matters that should be dealt with in the code, rather than matters that, as this document demonstrates, are still under consideration. Yes, that's what I said, yes. Yes. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm clearly not making myself clear. I'm asking you to yes. identify whether any of the matters listed in paragraph 14 are matters that will now be included in the code, given that the document describes them as matters that are still under consideration for inclusion in the code. Yes, there's eight points to 14. Um, I can't say for absolute certainty that they will be in the next iteration, but um, as that's still being formed as we speak, I would be, it would be highly likely in my view I that see. those points would be included. I want to move to asking you some questions, Ms Lone, about the relationship between the life insurance industry and the financial advice industry. Um, the FSC represents both the life insurance industry and entities in the financial advice industry. The advice licensees yes. companies, yes. Uh, and it's the peak representative body for the life insurance industry? The FSC is, yes. Yes. Uh, and it's one of several bodies that represent financial advice entities, license holders, um, they're also represented, some of them, by other organisations, is that right? I don't know about that. All right. Now, the financial advice industry was um, examined in the second round of the Commission's hearings in April this year, and at the beginning of um, this round of hearings, we touched on the relationship between the two industries. Um, we heard that in the last five years, the life insurance industry has paid around $6 billion in commissions to financial advisers. Yes. Uh, and we heard about a number of other types of payments that the life insurance industry makes to financial advisers, including sponsorship payments. Yes. Um, did you hear the evidence that Mr Whelan gave earlier, Ms Lone? Yes. Uh, his evidence was that in relation to add-on insurance sold through car dealers, insurers saw car dealers as the customer, um, not the end customer. Did you hear that evidence? Yes, I did, yes. And is that uh, the way life insurers see financial advisors? I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I couldn't say yes or no. It, it's possible, but you'd probably have to ask um, an insurer. Um, Ms Lone, the life insurance industry pays vast sums of money to financial advisers, doesn't it? I don't know the, the number. I do know that they have been capped in, in legislation. Um, would you agree that when the industry pays, the life insurance industry pays commissions to financial advisers, it expects something in return? A good product, um, good advice, um, yes. Well, what is all the money for, Ms Lone? What is the approximately $6 billion paid by the life insurance industry in commissions to financial advisers for? I really couldn't say with certainty. These are, these are to do with commissions that are paid to advisers yes. for essentially um, for essentially selling their products. Um, this was subject of the ASIC report that triggered the Trowbridge inquiry. 
the and led to legislation which capped those high upfront commissions. Well, the whole point of paying commissions to financial advisors is to influence the advice that they give, isn't it? To, it would certainly mean that they are paying commissions for their products to be sold, yes. And the cost of the commissions is borne ultimately by the consumer in the form of increased premiums. Do you accept that? I don't know. I couldn't say. Uh, you know that financial advisers have a duty to act in the best interests of their customers when providing financial advice? Yes, I do. And do you agree that by providing benefits to financial advisers to influence the advice that they give, life insurance companies create a conflict of interest for financial advisers? That has definitely happened and that was the subject of the ASIC review that triggered the Trowbridge report, yes. Well, are you familiar with the um, FOFA reforms that came into effect in yes. uh, July 2013? Are you familiar with the ban on conflicted remuneration introduced by those reforms? Yes. Uh, did the FSC support the FOFA reforms when they were introduced? Um, it was before my time, um, I believe so. Um, you're Life unable insurance. to say? I believe so. I, I'm unable to say. When it was introduced, the ban on conflicted remuneration didn't apply to life risk insurance products other than group life policy for members of superannuation entities or life policies for members of default superannuation funds. Are you aware of that? Yes. And what was the FSC's position on that exemption? Did it support it? I believe so. Does it still support it? Um, we initiated the Trowbridge report, which led to the commissions being reduced. So I'm not sure that, that we would... I think the position has changed. Are you familiar with the life insurance framework reforms, Ms Lone? Yes, we are. Uh, and as a result of those reforms from the 1st of January this year, a cap has been imposed on the amount that can be paid in upfront and trailing commissions to financial advisers in relation to life insurance products? Yes. And that caps currently 80% of the first year's premium? That's correct. And next year it will be 70%? That's as I understand it, yes. And from January 2020 it will be 60%? Yes. Should it stop there, Ms Lone? Uh, I think we will think about that when the time comes. Um, this was uh, the life insurance reforms came out of the Trowbridge report, which, as I said, um, the FSC and the AFA initiated. Um, the government initiated that legislation, which essentially um, reduced the high upfront commissions for sales of life insurance products through advisors. Um, there is a review that ASIC is going to do, I think next year, which will be useful in, in us getting some more information on whether that, that's addressed some of those misaligned incentives. Ms Lone, I want to ask you finally on that topic, why shouldn't uh, commissions for life insurance products be phased out entirely? I think that is a, that is a view um, that various people have had, um, including in the FSC. Um, I think the reason that life insurance was carved out initially from FOFA um, went to that um, tenet that life insurance is something that people have to be persuaded to buy. Um, therefore, um, people needed to be incentivised to sell it. Um, but certainly we would like to see the effect of the uh, legislation and the APRA review and, uh, and make decisions then. I want to return uh, to the Life Code, uh, Ms Lone. You say in your statement that the FSC doesn't plan to submit the current version of the Life Code for approval by ASIC? Not the one that's in the market now, no. But it's ultimately the FSC's intention for the Life Code to be approved by ASIC? Correct. And will it submit the next version for approval? It's very possible. Um, we haven't really made up our minds about that yet. We, we're, we're having um, monthly meetings with ASIC um, to make sure that we are um, adhering to the regulations which lead to approval 
by ASIC, and it's very much our intention. You know that one of the matters that ASIC looks for when deciding whether to approve an industry code is whether it's enforceable? Yes, that's correct. Is the life code enforceable? We believe so. Uh, how? Uh, through the Life Code Compliance Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what does the Life Code Compliance Committee do to enforce the Life Code? Mm. The, the Life Code Compliance Committee is um, an independent uh, three-person body that is um, administered by, uh, by FOS. Um, again, that came out of the Trowbridge Review as a recommendation that we have a life code and that it be supported by an independent um, compliance body. Um, and it, it um, is able to enforce actions on insurers who breach the life code. In your statement, you say at paragraph 16.2, breaches of the life code will be taken into account in both internal and external dispute resolution process. Yes. In this way, the life code is enforceable. Yes. Um, what, what does it mean to take into account a breach of the code? Um, the life code compliance committee um, asks our life insurers who have signed uh, a contract with the Life Code Compliance Committee um, to go through the, the, the terms of the code and show the Life Code Compliance Committee how they are adhering to those clauses. Um, and they also do need to um, inform the Life Code Compliance Committee of breaches through or complaints through their internal processes. And the Life Code Compliance Committee um, uh, can then um, uh, enforce any breaches of the code onto the insurers. And there is um, a mechanism whereby um, the consumer is um, also given um, the contact number for FOS, and they can then take um, up a complaint with FOS as well. Well, can I take you to the relevant part of the life code, um, uh, Ms. Lyon, which is RCD 0021 0023 0001. Thank you. And if we turn to 0027 and 0028. Zero zero two seven and zero zero two eight. We see that section thirteen of the code deals with monitoring, enforcement, and sanctions. Yes. And we see from clause thirteen point four that the code requires subscribers to report significant breaches of the code to the committee. Yes. And the committee has the power under clause 13.8C to investigate alleged breaches. Yes. And under 13.8E uh, to agree corrective measures with a life insurer. Yes. And under 13.8F to monitor the implementation of agreed corrective measures. Yes. And if the insurer fails to rectify a breach or agree on corrective measures under clause 13.10, the committee can impose a sanction. Yes. And the sanctions include requiring rectification of the breach, giving a warning, requ requiring an audit, requiring corrective advertising, and publishing non-compliance on the website. Yes. Has the committee imposed sanctions on any subscribers to the code? I have, um, no, it hasn't. I've, that's the information that we've got from the Life Code complaint. It hasn't, complaint. has it? No, it hasn't. Uh, and you say in your statement that when the Life Code was drafted, it wasn't contemplated that it would be incorporated into contracts with consumers? Yes. Could I just explain the reason that no sanctions have been applied? Um, the Life Code Compliance Committee hasn't actually reported on its first year yet. Mm -hmm. 
So um, they, they just haven't made those determinations you've, yet. You've read the statement from the representative of yes. the Life Code Committee, which yes. shows us that no sanctions have been applied? That, correct, they haven't reported yet. Well, no, it tells us that no sanctions have been applied. Have you read that statement, Ms yes. Lone? Yes. All right. Um, now, uh, I asked you about um, your statement, uh, in your statement that when the Life Code was drafted, it wasn't contemplated that it would be incorporated into contracts yes. with consumers. Um, does the FSC oppose the requirements of the code being incorporated into contracts with consumers? We have not um, fully formed our view on that. Certainly the first edition of the Life Code wasn't uh, put together with uh, contractual obligations in mind. Um, and as I say, the second um, at this stage has not been either. Uh, it's not that it's a, a firm no, it's just that it hasn't been contemplated at this point. Um, you say in your statement that the obligations in the code are aspirational. Yes. and not easily translated into law? Yes. What do you mean by aspirational, Ms Lone? I think what we mean um, by aspirational is that um, we give a lot of, um, a, a great deal of detail about um, behaviour, how we will treat you, a lot of time frames that are very specific around claims, etc. Um, and they're sort of service agreements um, which are I guess if you translate them are very aspirational. We okay. want we want them to to be um, adhered to 100% of the time, but sometimes there may be circumstances where they cannot be. So I just want to understand: Are you saying that the time frames imposed under the code for the handling of claims and for communications with customers are aspirational? No, they're very much in the code. Um, that may not be the best example of the use of the word aspirational. Well, it's the I suppose, example you gave in your statement, yes, isn't it? Yes, it, it, it is. It may not be the best example with hindsight. Uh, I think what we're trying to say there is if we do breach, if our members do breach those timeframes, then that is a hard, um, that is a hard breach of the code um, and it would, be, um, it would be reported to the Life Code Compliance Committee, even if it was a day late as being a breach of the code. It's probably not the best example. I think perhaps where we talk about aspirational, it's more around behaviours. Um, we will treat you with empathy and, and, and respect and compassion at claims time, etc. They're aspirational, that the claimant will be treated with empathy and respect? They are. No, we're putting them in the code. They must be adhered to. But are they examples of things that you regard as aspirational? They're things that we believe must be adhered to. Um, well, what use is aspirational statements to consumers in a document like this, Ms Lone? Well, I think it's, it's very useful to have um, the um, the code written in plain English um, with a lot of points and granularity um, so people can understand it. Um, I, I, take, I take your point about the word aspirational. It may not be the best use of the word. Um, do you know, uh, Ms Lone, that under the Competition and Consumer Act, as I um, said to Mr Whelan, a breach of an approved industry code of practice is treated as a contravention of the Act? I heard you say that to Mr Willen, but I have no further knowledge well, about that. Well, can I ask you, in relation to um, the life insurance industry, why that wouldn't be an appropriate approach for the life code? I'm sorry, I just don't... I haven't given that any consideration at this point. All right. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Yes, Mr Elliott. You honoured that, Mr Commissioner. Just a few things, very briefly. Um, Ms Lone, you referred to a Mr Kerwin in your evidence. Yes. Uh, who yes. is he? Um, Nick Kerwin is um, a senior policy manager at the FSC for life insurance. Um, does he have a, a function in relation to the um, improvements being made to the life code? Yes. Um, Mr Kerwin was hired specifically to, um, uh, to do all of our work on the life code. That is his, um, his full-time job. And what is your understanding of his training and experience in that field? He's had something like 30 years in life insurance um, with the regulator in the UK. All right. And were you responsible for hiring him for that purpose? Yes, I was. Right. Um, you were asked some questions about the LCCC, the yes. Life Compliance Code, and whether, to your knowledge, any sanctions had been imposed. Yes. Um, to your knowledge, how long has the um, committee been in existence for? 
I think it's just over a year, um, perhaps even shorter than that. I do know that they haven't yet um, reported their, their first report, if you like. To your knowledge, have consumers made submitted complaints to the committee? I don't know at this point. No, I don't know. Yes, that, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Mr. Excuse. Ms. Lyon, uh, thank you for coming. You are excused further attendance. Thank you. Yes, uh, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, during these hearings, we've tendered a number of witness statements provided to the Commission by life insurers and general insurers concerning the way that insurance products are designed and sold and the way that claims are handled. And at various points in the last two weeks, we've summarised the information and data set out in those statements. In the past few days, the Commission has received further witness statements from some of those insurers. Some of these further statements were provided by the insurers to correct errors in the information that they provided to the Commission. Others were provided in response to a request by the Commission for further information about particular topics. And we want to tender those statements, Commissioner. Um, the, the first is a supplementary statement from Westpac in relation to the sale of life insurance policies and specifically the commissions paid in relation to those policies. In our opening statement last Monday, we referred to information provided by Westpac in the statement of Michael Wright, dated the 23rd of August. Late last week, Westpac informed the Commission that some of the data provided in Mr Wright's statement was incorrect. A supplementary statement was provided by Westpac correcting that information. I'll tender the supplementary witness statement of Michael Wright, dated the 21st of September 2018. Give it 6.410. Uh, we received another supplementary statement from Westpac in relation to the handling of life insurance claims. In our statement about the handling of life insurance claims last Wednesday, we referred to information provided by Westpac in the statement of Susan Horton, dated the 28th of August, and that information formed part of the basis for the charts tendered in connection with that statement. And earlier this week, Westpac told the Commission that some of the data provided in that statement was incorrect. A supplementary statement was provided on Wednesday correcting that information. I tender the supplementary witness statement of Susan Horton, dated the 19th of September 2018. That becomes Exhibit 6.411. We also received a supplementary statement from Allianz in relation to the handling of general insurance claims. In the introduction to the general insurance part of the hearings on Monday, we referred to information provided by Allianz in the statement of David Krowitz, dated the 30th of August 2018. That information formed part of the basis for the charts tendered in connection with that statement. Yesterday, Allianz told the Commission that some of the data provided in that statement was incorrect. A supplementary statement was provided by Allianz yesterday, correcting that information. I tender the supplementary witness statement of David Krowitz, dated the 20th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.412. I turn to the further request for information um, from the Commission. On Monday, we made some observations about the monetary benefits provided by general insurers to Australian financial services licence holders or authorised representatives of AFSL holders in circumstances where an employee or authorised representative of that entity might be expected to provide personal financial advice in relation to general insurance products. These products were limited to motor vehicle, insurance, home and contents insurance and travel insurance. And we observed that in the period from the 1st of July 2013 to the 30th of June this year, Allianz had told the Commission that it had paid more than $240 million in commissions to those entities, IAG more than $500 million in commissions to those entities, and QBE, more than $800 million in commissions to those entities. Earlier this week, we sought further statements from the general insurers that we referred to on Monday, 
requesting that they also provide information about the monetary benefits they provided to entities that distributed motor vehicle insurance, home and contents insurance and travel insurance products issued by that insurer in circumstances where either general advice or no advice was provided. And the witness statements that we received from the general insurers showed that each of them paid the following monetary benefits to distribution entities in the five-year period that we asked about. Westpac paid more than $270 million. CBA, including Cominsure, paid more than $290 million. AAI paid more than $350 million. QBE paid more than $740 million. IAG paid more than $1.27 billion and Allianz and AWP paid more than $1.28 billion. That amounts to a total of more than $4.2 billion in monetary benefits to distribution entities in connection with the sale of general insurance products issued by these insurers in about five years. We note that some of the entities told us that there is overlap between these benefits and the commissions we referred to earlier in relation to sales where personal advice is provided, as some AFSL holders who provide personal advice about general insurance products might also be expected to sell, promote or provide general advice about those products. <laughs> Commissioner, I tender the further witness statements that set out the information I've referred to in relation to AAI, I tender the witness statement of Andrew Mayer, dated the 19th of September 2018. 6.413. In relation to uh, Allianz, I tender the witness statement of Michael Winter, dated 19 September 2018. 6.414. In relation to IAG, I tender the witness statement of Mark Milliner, dated 19 September 2018. Exhibit four, uh, 6.415. In relation to CBA, I tender the witness statement of Miles Salden, dated the 19th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.416. And the witness statement of Gareth Russell, dated the 20th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.417. In relation to QBE, I tender the witness statement of Christopher Kalauri, dated the 19th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.418. In relation to ANZ, I tender the witness statement of David Roberts, dated 19 September 2018. Exhibit 6.419. In relation to Westpac, I tender the witness statement of Susan Horton, dated 19 September 2018. Exhibit 6.420. And in relation to UE, I tender the witness statement of Bert Backer, dated 19 September 2018. Exhibit 6.421. Uh, Commissioner, we're now in a position to commence our closing address for this round of hearings, but perhaps it would be desirable to have a brief break uh, to allow the Financial Services Council uh, to leave the bar table. Yes, so if I come back at what, 25 past? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Yes.